Hello, the Gordon here. In this Facebook Live I've called Hip Hip Hooray for Andy Murray. And Andy Murray is, has announced that he's going to be retiring this year in 2019. But the question is, when in 2019? Because he was doing a press conference in advance of the Australian Open, which is about to start. And he's been blubbing again. He's been blubbing again. Because he announced that he's intending to retire after Wimbledon 2019 to make Wimbledon his last tournament. But he might not get that far. I don't, personally, I don't think he will. And here's why. He's been in pain from his hip. Hip, hip, hooray for Andy Murray. See what he did? Hip, he's been in pain from his hip. And he's had operations. He's had lots of operations over the years, as do many sports stars, particularly tennis stars, because singles tennis is a brutal sport on the body. And he said he's been in a lot of pain for at least 20 months. And it's been clear to anyone watching that he's not at the levels that he was when he won the US Open and he won Wimbledon and he won the Olympics. And people doubted whether he was ever going to get back to those levels. And he's doubted it himself. And now he's saying, I'm not sure that I will. And it looks like I might have to have a hip replacement. And he said, some other people have a hip replacement and then come back and play. But he's saying, I'm not going to be doing that. If I have to have a hip replacement, it's to do with my quality of life after tennis. Now, I talk about sport a lot when it comes to goal achievement and self-improvement, as you'll know if you follow me for any length of time, because you, it, it illustrates it so clearly. And this is a classic case in point that he's had to pay, play in pain for all that time. And in order to get to the top of the game, to win Wimbledon, to win the Olympics and to stay there, He's put his body through so much on a daily basis that he now has to look at his quality of life regarding pain for the rest of his life. And in all likelihood, that's involving a hip operation and he's only a young man. Now, I remember following Andy Murray from his early days when he won the junior US Open, big shock of hair and a moody git is how he came across very moody and surly and bordering on the unpleasant, but fiercely competitive. And that stuck out like a sore thumb because when he was rising up, it coincided with the end of Tim Henman's career, who was the British number one before that and our big hope of winning Wimbledon. And he got to the semi-final and he was a classic British nearly sporting story a British hero that nearly got there and when Andy Murray was coming through people in the Wimbledon audience would shout out come on Tim and it was hilarious <laughs> but Andy Murray didn't find it funny at the time you could tell he wasn't happy at all <laughs> and as I said he came across as very moody in his interviews very surly giving you know, short answers to journalists, no smiling going on, no fun involved. And then he made a comment about the 2006 World Cup, where Scotland hadn't qualified, and a journalist asked him if he would be supporting Scotland. <laughs> and Andy said he'd be supporting anyone but England, right, as a joke. Because he's got a very dry sense of humour. And it was a joke with the journalist, but suddenly it blew up in his face. British sports player, the Scot Andy Murray, has said he'd be supporting anyone but England. <laughs> and he said he learnt a lesson then as well. And that didn't help with his popularity front, because he had this surly image, a sort of snarly image. And he was a British, a Scot, a British player, who said he was going to be supporting anyone but England. Even though it was a joke. But then some odd things happened. He got to the final of Wimbledon and there hadn't been a British male 
player winning the singles since Fred Perry 70 odd years previously and he lost to Roger Federer and in the on-court interviews post-match Sue Barker said are you gonna have a chat with us and Andy Murray said well I'll have a go but it's not gonna be easy and then started blubbing again <laughs> and the whole crowd at Centre Court of Wimbledon went ah like pantomime and what that did was it it gave him a breakthrough in the heart of the British sporting public who suddenly realised that beneath that surly, snarling, fierce competitor was a person which sometimes gets lost, doesn't it, when we're following sports people talking about their careers and their press interviews but we forget that they're actually a person trying to do their best, trying to achieve things and getting upset when it doesn't go well. So yes, and then of course he won Wimbledon. He actually got that achievement done. And it's something that hadn't been done by a British male sportsman for 70 odd years. And we like our sport here in Britain and we like our sporting stories. I know I certainly do. So it was a big story. And then even more than that, he then went on to win the Olympics gold at London. So you can see those, it's sort of a perfect storm of goodness for him to get entrenched with the British public. And he's for, that firmly established him as a British sporting great. He could have retired there and then and his place would have been established. He's got the money. He's never going to run out of work, is he, as a pundit in sports broadcasting if he wants to. So he could have retired there and then. And he would have been in pain there and then. Because elite sports people always play through some kind of pain. Because at the elite level, sport is brutal. And then there's the training, which is brutal as well. But he didn't retire there and then because it's his thing. It's his passion. It's what he does. And an elite sports person knows that their career is not going to last forever. So when they're at their peak, they want to get as much out of it as they can. And that makes sense because they put decades into getting to that place in the first place. So there's some huge goal achievement stories and illustrations in there. Starting out young, working for a long, long, long long time, many, many years, making progress, setbacks, making progress, setbacks, making progress, setbacks. You get an idea with that one. Pain, lots of pain, pain playing, pain training. And then when you get to the top, you've got to choose whether you've got to stay there or you're going to retire there and then. And he's now a family man, married, kid, family. So he's looking at his life after tennis. He's achieved that. He's done that. He'll be able to put it in the cupboard when he's retired, which might be in the summer. It might be right now. Because I, I think he knows why he's always crying at the press conference. I think he knows. I don't think he'll get through the Australian Open. Now, the Australian Open is obviously now, very early in the year. And the rest of the Opens, the, the, the other three majors, you've got the French, Wimbledon and the US, they're later in the year. I don't think he'd play in Paris on clay. He's not, gonna, he's not likely to win that at his current level. So I don't think he'll play that. And then he's got Wimbledon. So he can pull out, uh, try... He, as he always, he's always going to, he's going to try the Australian Open because he's got that competitive spirit. So he can see how far he gets in Australia and he might have to pull out in the first match. Who knows? And then he won't have to play again, maybe until Wimbledon. And then he can retire and do a sort of, you know, a celebration appearance at Wimbledon. And... So hip hip hooray to Andy Murray, I say. I was one of the people who, I wasn't a big fan of his when he first started. I, you know, he's a bit surly. Oh, here's another goal achievement point about his surliness. When things went wrong for him 
on court in a match, what he used to do was get really annoyed at himself and annoyed at people in his box, his coaches and his family, shouting, snarling, swearing at them. And what happened was, when he started doing that, his game would fall apart and he would almost inevitably lose the match. But what was a big turning point for him was when he teamed up with Ivan Lendl, had him as his coach. Another well-known player who got to the top but was always also a bit surly. <laughs> and Ivan Lendl managed, the big difference he made was he got Andy Murray to stop doing this shouting at his box and stop the snarling and swearing on court and turn that focus back on the next point, which is a massive aspect of singles tennis, the next point. And when he did that, he started winning and then he got he got this huge success breakthroughs. And in recent years, people have noted that he's, he's sort of slipped back into this snarly shouting at the public box, shouting at himself, and the results haven't gone his way. So that's another goal achievement lesson about you know, do things this way, you're going to get certain results. Stop doing it that way and do it a different way and you might get different slash better results. One of the reasons why I use sport a lot, talking about self-improvement, goal achievement and wealth creation. Now, my eight-step goal achievement formula, which Andy Murray has certainly followed, he didn't follow it thanks to me, I hasten to add, what I mean is you can see the formula in his career and what he, what he has done and what he's doing right up to the present day, January the 11th. I'm going to be covering that eight-step goal achievement formula in my Transform Your Life Now program this weekend. And you can see that at transformyourlifenow.com where I'm combining the self-improvement goal achievement stuff alongside turning your passions into profits. So transformyourlifenow.com, pop over and take a look. I'll be covering that eight-step goal achievement formula in a live training this weekend where we can look at how you can apply it to your goals and your passions and your dreams specifically. So let me know what you think. Do you like tennis? Do you watch tennis or sport at all? Let me know what you think about Andy Murray. Do you like him? Because I mentioned his his dry sense of humour, which came out more after he'd won Wimbledon and after he won the Olympics. I think the pressure was off his shoulders and he was able to relax more and open up in the media more and his dry sense of humour came through. So, let me know what you think. I hope all is well with you. Wishing you as ever health and happiness and a hip hip hooray to Andy Murray. That's Sir Andy Murray, by the way. Uh, and I will speak to you again soon.